started now. So good afternoon, everybody in Ethiopia. And uh, we just realized today is a holiday in Ethiopia that it's a Labor Day. So for those of you who are diehard and uh, attending today's uh, webinar, thank you for coming. And um, I hope uh, this is going to be worthwhile. Uh, and uh, we have as a speaker today, uh, Dr. Uh, Mola, who uh, we have presented him in the past and he has uh, talked to you previously, specifically on respiratory failure. Um, this is a continuation of the two week um, series of talks on respiratory failure. And today his topic is on non-invasive support in COVID-19 associated with acute respiratory failure, as you can see from his title. Um, we have probably about 30 to 40 minutes or 30 to 35 minutes presentation and we have uh, ample time for discussions. Uh, if you have also questions from uh, the previous sessions that you want to send our way, please type, in, type them in the chat section so that I can get them and uh, collate and uh, so that we can have a nice and robust discussion at the end. I would really uh, advise everybody again to mute your phones and mute your um, your um, uh, uh, computers. Uh, sometimes with the videos, if you get less reception, um, please also take the video down because that's uh, one way for you to have really a good uh, way of um, uh, receiving the voice and the slides uh, better. So with that, without any further delay, uh, I just welcome uh, Dr. Mola for this uh, presentation. So, Dr. Mola, please uh, take it over. Thanks. Are you, you're muted, so. Uh, Malaku, yeah, you're okay now, Go ahead. Good morning uh, for those of you who are in the United States and good afternoon for people in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, again, my name is Mola. We, uh, we talked about acute respir respiratory failure in COVID patients uh, uh, like a couple of weeks ago. This is a continuation of that and I will try to make this as simple and as practical as possible. Uh, some of the devices uh, <clears throat> that we're gonna talk about may not be widely available in Ethiopia. But you know, we want to use this as a learning opportunity as well. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, I would like to make this presentation a little brief and allow more time for discussion. That's, I think, uh, perhaps more important. Uh, moving forward, uh, so we're going to have a discussion on any invasive supports uh, today. And uh, the coming two presentations will focus on mechanical ventilation. Uh, and, uh, and geared to the patients with COVID-19. So last time we reviewed uh, symptoms of patients with COVID-19. Uh, if you recall, uh, we, we said and we talked that uh, most patients present with uh, dry uh, cough, uh, along with uh, very non-specific viral syndromes. Uh, patients feel very fatigued. Uh, they have a lot of myalgias and arthralgias. Um, uh, also, fever is a very, very common uh, presenting symptom as well. And uh, as patients get sicker, they start to feel short of breath. And, and other symptoms like GI symptoms and neurologic symptoms are also uh, not uncommon. So when these patients present to healthcare systems uh, for worsening symptoms most commonly is due to uh, progressive difficulty in, in uh, breathing and they feel extremely fatigued not able to take anything uh, po uh, some patients get confused uh, they have some neurologic symptoms as well and on an evaluation in the emergency room uh, you may notice that these patients are quite hypoxemic uh, with increased load of uh, mechanical work of breathing Again, they have high fevers. Uh, those patients can be uh, very tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, and also on workup, you may notice some specific organ dysfunction commonly. In addition to, uh, as you know, it's mainly respiratory disease, but we see patients develop acute renal failure 
uh, you see a quite significant derangement in liver numbers too. So these are the common uh, uh, reasons for patients to be to be hospitalized. Now, the question is how do we care for these patients? Again, uh, most importantly, uh, when these patients, there should be appropriate triaging system when these patients show to emergency room to with these symptoms to try to uh, triage them appropriately, uh, uh, place them in an area that's designated for this kind of patients so that we can minimize exposure to staff and other patients. Uh, then after appropriate workup, uh, 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 including commonly lab work, uh, just radiography, uh, and in, in rare situations, maybe a CT scan, then appropriate <coughs> placement into appropriate uh, area. It could be, you know, these patients, even if they present with this kind of symptoms, they may be okay, and they may be okay to, to go home to be managed as an outpatient versus admission to the general care unit in the hospital versus critical care, depending on uh, their respiratory and hemodynamic situation. Then almost uh, routinely, these patients are placed uh, on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, if these patients are generally healthy and has not been, has, have not been healthy care setting, for example, they can be treated with routine community acquired pneumonia protocol versus patients who have multiple chronic problems. Uh, or patients who've been hospitalized recently, typically we uh, we uh, we use broader antibiotics uh, because it's always difficult to differentiate initially to differentiate between routine uh, garden variety community acquired pneumonia versus versus COVID. Even if they have COVID, they can have concomitant bacterial infections. So, so until workup is completed, uh, try to be aggressive at the beginning and start them on antibiotics. The other thing that's commonly, uh, 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 I try to emphasize this last point, the other thing that's commonly pra practiced even in here and perhaps in Ethiopia as well, is when these patients show up in the hospital, they're almost universally placed on <clears throat> intravenous fluids. If they're septic, hypotensive, acute kidney injury, and things like that, if there is strong indication, then we can administer conservative fluid management. Uh, but you know, as, lo as, as, as long as uh, hemodynamic situation and renal function are low, so it's perhaps a good idea to diarise them. This patient to diarise these patients, keep them in the in the dry side. The other thing that we've discussed last time, and, and you're well aware, is antiviral therapy, which is a point of contention still. There is no, uh, as, as as we speak, there is no. Um, magical therapy for this virus and uh, care of these patients is mainly supportive. Uh, uh, combination of antibiotics, antiviral drugs like uh, uh, HIV medications. Uh, even more recently, uh, the one that's w widely used like hydroxychloroquine and plaquenil are most recent data are suggesting that this might not be as helpful as initially thought. Uh, there is a interleukin-6 targeted therapy. Um, small data shows that that might be more beneficial than those. And then the other thing that's probably has been in the media and you as you are aware, there is some promising data uh, about uh, uh, a nucleoside an analog called remdesivir. The, there is it's it's again very early and then until it becomes widely available and used uh, for patients, uh, it's. It's, it's uh, we're, even if it's found to be very useful, then until we get that for the majority of our patients, it will be a long road ahead. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, even though it's not the focus of this presentation, is empiric anticoagulation. Um, multiple autopsy studies, mainly from the uh, state of Louisiana, did show that these patients have extensive pulmonary microthrombi. Uh, they're very prone to, uh, to uh, coagulopathy, um, and then based on my own experience, uh, we check uh, a number of uh, labs to, to try to stratify patients who are uh, already on, on the higher side of you know thromboembolic situation and put them on heparin infusion empirically. And even then, we see a lot of deep venous thrombosis, uh, decline in oxygen therapy and stuff like that, probably due to uh, pulmonary Microthrombi as well. So we are 
starting to anticoagulate most of these patients symptomatically. There's a more heparin or even on stronger I mean, uh, other medications like uh, like ergotroban or other, other anticoagulants. So consider anticoagulating these patients uh, who are seriously ill, and especially if the dimers, uh, C-reactive protein, and the like are elevated. So this is kind of to touch, uh, to briefly summarize the uh, general outline of care for these patients. Uh, focus on respiratory support. So when these patients show up in the emergency room, uh, if they're in distress and hypoxemic, start with uh, low flow nasal cannula. Uh, especially if, for example, if someone's oxygen saturation is like 86, 88, uh, 90, something like that, they might, you know, do well on low flow nasal, regular nasal cannula. Uh, but if they look in severe uh, distress and oxygen saturation is very low, then you may need to be a little more aggressive, including uh, going directly into intubation and mechanical ventilation versus, versus use of uh, uh, more higher oxygen delivery methods like high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation, which we're going to touch uh, 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 in the coming few slides. Uh, so, and then the other thing that we will consider doing is uh, prone positioning. And obviously, as I said, if the patients are sick or if the patients are not doing well on a limited time, time limited trial of this non-invasive support, uh, intubation and uh, mechanical ventilation is the way to go. So these are the different oxygen delivery devices. Uh, I'm sure all, all of us are familiar with this. A simple nasal cannula, usually uh, it helps you deliver up to six liters of uh, oxygen. And there are uh, a little bit uh, more recently larger bore cannula that can deliver, help deliver up to 50 liters of nasal cannula, uh, oxygen through this kind of device. And then this one is a oxy mask. Uh, so this can deliver a relatively higher humidified, higher amount of oxygen. And then this is uh, what we call non rebreather mask. Uh, there is, as you see, there's a reservoir bag, bag in here, uh, oxygen that's coming from the cylinder or from the uh, concentrator. Uh, gets uh, stored in, in here, and as the patient breathes in, there is a one-way valve somewhere there, and the patient can breathe air in. And this is kind of a, a non-finistrated uh, mask, so when the patient breathes out, air uh, air goes out around on the side. On the side. And so <clears throat> this one helps you deliver a higher concentration of oxygen compared to the simple oxy mask. Uh, what I would like to talk about is a high flow, next is a high flow nasal cannula. You see this uh, uh, is a prototype device. There are different devices, uh, then the different manufacturers. You would see different names like Vapoterm, um, high flow nasal cannula, OptiFlow. It has different names. So it's pretty much they operate on a, a similar principle. And this, is widely used since a landmark study was published in New England Journal of Medicine about five, six years ago. So if you look at here, it has two knobs. Uh, one allows you to increase the flow of oxygen and the other one is allow, the, other, the other knob allows you to adjust the FiO2, the fractional oxygen uh, uh, of inspired oxygen. So <clears throat> generally this kind of device allows you to deliver higher flow of uh, pressurized uh, oxygen uh, up to 60 liters per minute. And you can, as I said, you can adjust the uh, FiO2 uh, up to 100% if needed. So high flow nasal cannula, so it's delivered through a very spongy, comfortable nasal prongs. Uh, and uh, that device allows you to humidify air as well. So high flow nasal cannula involves continuous delivery of up to 60 liters, as I said, uh, uh, and you can optimize its humidity uh, and heat. It's became more and more popular because that landmark study that I am going to show you uh, shortly did show that patients with a, a acute hypoxemic respiratory failure tend to do well. At least it's not inferior to non-invasive ventilation and maybe even uh, has a mortality benefit. And it's very easy to apply uh, and patients tend to tolerate it very, very well compared to uh, 
non-invasive ventilation that's provided through face mask. And it has become, as I said earlier, an important and perhaps better uh, alternative for, uh, for patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So this study was published uh, in 2015 in New England Journal of Medicine. If you look at the conclusion, just this part only. So what they did was uh, they divided uh, patients presenting with acute severe hypoxemic respiratory failure into three groups. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the groups were put on, uh, uh, I think I have another slide actually here. Yeah, one of the groups was put on standard non breather mask and the other one was placed on a, a non-invasive ventilation and the third group was, were placed on this high flow nasal cannula and and if you look at the outcomes, so what the, the two most important outcomes they looked into were the rate of uh, progressive respiratory failure requiring mechanical intubation, mechanical ventilation, and also mortality. So if you look at this, um, rate of intubation is lower in the high flow nasal cannula group compared to the other two, yeah, but it did not reach statistical significance. But when they selected patients who had even severe hypoxemic respiratory failure with a PO2 slash FiO2 ratio of less than 200, uh, then high flow nasal cannula uh, was by far better compared to then rebreather mask and standard oxygen. And as you see here, it did reach statistical significance. And then the other important outcome they looked into is um, survival at 90 days. So as you see, uh, there is a higher survival rate with high, this kaplan meyer curve shows you higher survival rate for high flow nasal cannula compared to the other two <coughs> devices. There are so, uh, many other things they looked into, but the most important, you know, uh, uh, in the points they looked into were uh, rate of intubation and, and the survival at 90 days. And again, compared to, you know, patient tolerance is much superior compared to an invasive ventilation. That's also another important factor because there are a lot of patients who are claustrophobic, cannot tolerate the BiPAP mask, um, and they tend to do well on high flow nasal cannula. So when it comes to, you know, <laughs> what gets us here, the COVID situation, uh, again, uh, the, we are all learning every day, and there's no strong and solid data with regard to high flow nasal cannula versus BiPAP versus not to do all of this. But uh, generally, we can say that we need to use these devices with uh, caution. Uh, of course, um, uh, our concern number one is uh, when we deliver this high flow uh, oxygen, there might be increased chance of aerosolization. And then there's limited data that show that uh, uh, these patients tend, you know, most patients eventually tend to fail and require uh, intubation mechanical ventilation. So if you use it, uh, you have to monitor patients uh, very uh, closely and do not delay intubation. Uh, <clears throat> but if you use it appropriately in, uh, in select situations, um, uh, in experts believe that airborne transmission to staff is low compared to uh, an invasive ventilation. If you use, if you use well-fitted uh, systems and if staff do wear uh, proper uh, protective equipment and proper infection control uh, precautions are implemented. And then it's probably even safer if these patients are placed in uh, negative pressure rooms, but as we know, the, these negative pressure rooms are not widely available, especially in Ethiopian context. So if you look at the WHO guidelines, um, uh, they, they're saying that uh, newer and well-fitted systems, as I said, are probably probably have uh, less risk of aerosolization, and then this can be used. Non-invasive ventilation uh, refers to the delivery of positive uh, pressure ventilation through uh, an invasive interface, which could be a nasal mask, face mask, nasal uh, prongs, or nasal pillows, or uh, uh, maybe really a helmet. Uh, you typically, uh, we use uh, bi-level uh, positive pressure intubation, uh, uh, ventilation called BiPAP or a continuous airway pressure, what we call CPAP. So 
these are the different interfaces. The most common and widely used one is a um, uh, you know, partial face mask, the one that covers the nose and the face. Um, and here you also see uh, uh, just nasal mask, and and this is full face mask, and this one is a uh, positive pressure ventilation delivered through uh, nasal pillows. This this usually is used in a situation uh, uh, called sleep apnea at night when patients are not tolerating these full face masks. It's widely used in patients for sleep apnea. But for delivery of uh, oxygen positive pressure ventilation in uh, in uh, acute respiratory failure, we mostly use uh, the the mask that covers the face and the mouth. So important indications for uh, in, in general non-invasive ventilation uh, is <clears throat> uh, it, it has a quite significant role in treating uh, hypercapnic, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure due to COPD exacerbation uh, uh, or patients presenting with acute heart failure and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. These patients tend to benefit uh, uh, from uh, from non-invasive ventilation and also actually there's good data supporting the use of non-invasive ventilation in acute situation in this group of patients in COPD exacerbation and heart failure. But uh, it can be used uh, for pneumonia and or acute respiratory distress syndrome caused caused by different things outside, outside the lungs. Um, but data is uh, limited. Um, uh, in, in terms of its uh, mortality and uh, morbidity uh, outcomes. In chronic respiratory uh, uh, disease, uh, these devices are popular um, uh, for treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. For example, uh, uh, and the other indication is severe CO period. Obviously, there are criteria if they are chronic CO2 retainers. Uh, uh, after certain tests are done, patients can be placed on uh, an invasive ventilation, especially at night. Neuromuscular disorders uh, we treat with non-invasive uh, uh, ventilation include uh, res uh, chronic respiratory failure due to uh, ALS, uh, myotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, myasthenia gravis, or other neurological or neurologic disorders. Patients having chest wall disease, for example, patients with diaphragmatic paralysis, also can we use an non-invasive uh, ventilation chronically. And, and obesity, uh, obesity type of ventilation uh, uh, syndrome can be treated with non-invasive ventilation as well. So when, uh, if we decide to use these devices, uh, obviously there should not be contraindications. The common contraindications include altered mental status. If the patient is totally out and not able to protect airway, understand that when we deliver positive pressure ventilation, air also goes into the stomach and it can lead into stomach distension and aspiration. So patients need to be uh, alert enough to protect their airways. Uh, and uh, uh, other in, in, for example, if another in, uh, contraindication is that if the patient has like quite significant uh, maxillofacial injury and trauma, obviously you cannot use this kind of device, uh, devices. If there is a communicating intracranial injury as well, uh, like skull fracture, uh, you cannot use uh, this kind of devices. Uh, <clears throat> so if you decide to use non-invasive ventilation, uh, uh, you need to monitor these patients uh, uh, very, very closely. Um, uh, and it should only be implemented only for a time limited big, uh, uh, trial because these patients, when you evaluate them after one hour, after two hours, if they don't improve, or if they get worse, then uh, you don't want to delay uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation. So again, coming to COVID situation, uh, we generally, generally speaking, we tend not to use non invasive ventilation for COVID patients out of concern for aerosolization and risk for staff and other patients. Uh, and, uh, and a similar but smaller uh, outbreak uh, in, uh, in 2019 from a Middle Eastern respiratory virus. Uh, there was a <clears throat> quite significant failure rate. Patients placed on non-invasive ventilation, uh, about 90% of patients failed and eventually required uh, intubation. 
So this is, you know, another reason that you ha if you have to use it, you have to watch them very carefully, reassess in an hour or even at most two hours and decide if they are in the right trajectory that uh, work of breathing is getting better and oxygenation is getting better. Um, then we may continue to use them and eventually try to take them off. But if the uh, patient tends to remain very tachypneic, use of accessory muscles, diaphoretic, and oxygen saturation is marginal, if they are still tachycardic, then uh, uh, you should not delay intubation. But there are certain uh, situations that we were kind of forced to use BiPAP in this in the COVID patients. For example, uh, COVID tends to be more severe in patients with underlying uh, comorbid issues, as you know. And there's a lot of COPD patients uh, in our community, in the community that uh, I work here. So this, this number one, this kind of patients are susceptible for COVID-19 and, and as any other viral illness or bacterial pneumonia, it tends to trigger acute exacerbation of COPD. So if a patient presents with uh, uh, symptoms and signs of acute COPD exacerbation, then these devices can be used uh, to, to improve ventilation and alleviate work of breathing. But this kind of patients typically, we put them in negative pressure, pressure room and and then uh, use appropriate protective, uh, uh, personal protective equipment. Other situations that we've been using this BiPAP and invasive ventilation is that there are patients that do, who have uh, advanced directives that, that, and wishes that, or they tell you that I would never want to be on a mechanical ventilator if that day comes, you know, supporting me with other devices, but, uh, but if uh, everything doesn't, doesn't go well, then they may go. So in person, in other words, in a person who is clearly do not intubate and do not resuscitate status, then uh, you can support them uh, with these kind of devices uh, with BiPAP uh, or CPAP and see how they do along with the other supportive uh, therapeutic options. Um, and the other indication, as I said earlier, is acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema because sometimes patients present with acute respiratory failure and you know now we are suspicious in testing almost everyone showing some degree of respiratory symptoms so you don't know whether these patients uh, have covid or not so while they're being investigated but clinically they look like heart failure patients then we tend to put them in negative uh, pressure room and, and use bipap so in in summary uh, we tend not to use this these devices, as I said, but there are certain limited uh, situations that this device might be helpful. Uh, number one, acute COPD exacerbation. Uh, number two, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, and then uh, in a situation where the patient has do not resuscitate order. So CPAP might be uh, more useful in these patients compared to BiPAP. You know, the, the, these devices allow you Again, uh, you can select whether you want to use uh, continuous positive air pressure. That's uh, kind of one pressure that stays the same across uh, the entire respiratory cycle, both inspiratory and uh, expiratory. This is called CPAP. But the BiPAP allows you to adjust the pressure during inspiration and also the pressure during expiration, uh, called IPAP and EPAP. Uh, the IPAP is the uh, uh, <clears throat> inspired positive airway uh, pressure and EPAP is uh, positive airway pressure during exhalation. So that EPAP is equivalent to a, a PEEP in a mechanical ventilator. So expert, some experts suggest that CPAP might even be more uh, uh, realistic in using in COVID patients because uh, if there's a continuous uh, pressure applied to uh, recruit more alveoli, uh, then, then you can uh, you can improve hypoxemia that way, and then the other thing is that uh, the variation of pressure in uh, uh, BiPAP can lead into what we call atelectro trauma. Um, so CPAP doesn't do that. CPAP is a continuous pressure to try to recruit more alveoli and keep the alveoli open so that they can participate in in air, uh, air exchange. So instead of BiPAP, CPAP might even be uh, more more beneficial in patients. But again, as I said, we're learning every day and there's nothing, you know, uh, 
conclusive at this at this point. And the other theoretical advantage is that it does not augment tidal volumes because it's a continuous pressure. That way, uh, uh, patients that are uh, uh, breathing can uh, do not have larger tidal volumes. As we know, in patients who are intubated, smaller tidal vol volumes are very, very important thing that we need to keep an eye on uh, and make sure that we are doing small tidal volumes. And with, when it comes to CPAP, you know, some experts estimate that well, you get lower tidal volumes with CPAP compared to BiPAP. So that way, it may lead into a lesser chance of acute lung injury. Uh, related to uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation. But again, all this is uh, anecdotal. Yeah, so when you put patients uh, with CPAP, you can start with a pressure of about eight centimeter of water, see how they do if they are comfortable and oxygenation is improving, but not quite sufficient. You can go as high as 15 to 18, 18 centimeters of pressure. Uh, and obviously you titrate uh, FiO2 through this device uh, to try to uh, improve oxygenation and or compressing. And obviously, as I said earlier, we need to monitor these patients very closely, uh, or make sure that they're in the right trajectory, or if they fail, we should not delay intubation. The other thing, when, uh, I know there was a question last, last week about helmets in COVID patients. It was used uh, in Europe, mostly in Italy. Uh, helmets have been, um, talked about in management of sleep apnea here in the United States, but they're not widely available and they're not, as far as I know, they're not used for COVID patients. Um, so, as you see, it's, some patients don't tolerate the mask uh, sitting on their face and nose and delivering pressurized air, so they, they can be more comfortable on these helmets. Uh, and if the patient were to vomit, you know, again, vomiting and abdominal distension is a contraindication for BiPAP, but you know, uh, these patients can inadvertently vomit. If they do, the helmets might be better because uh, there is a lot of room there, in, uh, but patients on uh, face mask, they tend to aspirate. So we, they think that there might be lesser risk of aspiration in this kind of patients. Um, and there's uh, uh, small data that may show that this might, the patients placed on helmet can, uh, may have a lower risk of mortality uh, than, than other patients. This is the data I was able to find regarding helmets, but again, uh, we don't have experience. They are not used in the United States, uh, uh, be it for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in COVID or non-COVID situation. The other thing I would like to talk is a uh, prone positioning. Um, uh, prone positioning has been widely practiced uh, in the United States for the management of acute uh, respiratory failure. There was again a very good study um, that showed quite significant mortality benefit in patients uh, placed on uh, prone positioning. If a patient on mechanical ventilator requires uh, more than 60% of IO2 and more than a PIP of uh, 10, uh, they need to be placed in a prone positioning. Uh, and if it was applied early and long enough, generally patients were placed in prone position for about 16 to 18 hours uh, and uh, with breaks of 46 hours in supine position. So prone for 16 to 18 hours, supine for four to six hours. Uh, and the average proning time was uh, four times. Uh, so this study did show quite significant mortality benefit. 16% versus 32%. 32% in patients were non-prone versus 16% in patients who were placed on prone positioning. This is in addition to the usual respiratory care that we deliver. Now, multiple uh, recent small you know, case series and expert opinions indicated that prone positioning actually might be beneficial in patients who are not intubated as well. So if you remember from our last talk, we uh, did say that patients uh, uh, in a COVID situation, we should probably advocate for early intubation so that you're not in a crash uh, situation. Yeah, Mr. Where... Uh, Mr. Uh, some question uh, So <clears throat> patients with, in, in COVID, um, we, uh, 
tend to advocate early intubation because as I said, if we uh, wait until they crash, you know, we have to bag them, we have to suction them, and a lot of people can be involved and this could be too much risk for patients, uh, for staff and, uh, and other patients. But nowadays we are trying uh, in a very uh, monitored situation in an ICU setting, uh, we, we tend to monitor patients on high flow nasal cannula or even sip up along with uh, what we call self pointing we ask patients to lie on their on their uh, to sleep to lie on their stomach as much as tolerated typically uh, two two three hours at a time and then give them a break so this tends to show some benefit and that's what you know some experts are suggesting as well uh, but again especially in a person that you you who has uh, do not resist it order then this might be also an option, uh, uh, use of non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula coupled with, with uh, awake uh, prone positioning might be beneficial. But again, I, I want to emphasize again that if the patient clinically, it's obviously to the, that will be the decision of the clinician at bedside. The patient is not doing well clinically, uh, always do not delay intubation and avoid intubating in a crash situation. So coming to decision to intubate, uh, these patients, uh, COVID patients, uh, they have what we call silent hypoxia. You know, they require a lot of oxygen, like 60 liters on high flow nasal cannula, uh, 80-90%, um, or like 15 liters of oxygen on a non-rebreather mask. And they actually looking horrible, but they, they tell you that I feel fine. I <laughs> Uh, I feel fine. I don't feel short of breath. So this is um, this is the kind of when you see in a normal world in a non-COVID situation when we see patients requiring this kind of oxygen supplementation, they are really very they look really bad. They're so worked up. They're so tachypneic, tachycardic, diaphoretic, and you know name it. But these patients tend to feel okay, and you know in, in this situation you tend to you know watch them very closely and allow more time for prone positioning and the use of high flow nasal cannula, but understand that uh, uh, these patients can, <clears throat> can, can uh, crash any time requiring kind of emergent intubation. So um, just monitoring very closely is very, very essential. Um, that's why a work of breathing cannot be relied upon in these patients because they have very bad hypoxemia while they look okay when you just look at them. So uh, I think uh, when they reach to about 50 liters on the oxy mask or non breather or requiring more than 60, 70% FiO2 on this high flow nasal cannula or CPAP, then I think uh, we still need to advocate for, for um, uh, intubation. Uh, because if you uh, intubate these patients on a crash situation, again, uh, this might be too risky for stuff that's, uh, that's uh, uh, intubating, uh, for the, the, the stuff that are intubating. So again, as I said, exact timing when to intubate these patients is, remains a matter of debate. Uh, mostly we tend to ad advocate early intubation, but in a monitored situation, in those group of patients, uh, you can uh, try those non-invasive support and prone positioning. Um, but generally, usual and common indications for intubation are rising oxygen requirements, increased uh, words of work of breathing and clinical worsening. Uh, if the patient is developing a lot of secretion that they are not able to clear on their own, and acid-based status is worsening uh, and they become hemodynamically unstable requiring vasopressor support. And if their mental status is declining, these are the common indications for intubation and mechanical ventilation. With this, I will end my talk and uh, Dr. Zarihun uh, will be old on from this and talk about uh, mechanical ven ventilation of these patients into, into settings moving forward. If you have any questions, uh, uh, I guess the floor is open for discussion. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for this really very clear and concise presentation. And you have also given us you know, a fair amount of time for questions and answers. And of course, there are some questions. So before we open 
for questions. I know Dr. Zeryun is also on the line. So Dr. Zeryun, do you have anything to add or um, to elaborate on the issues that were raised? I don't know if you are muted. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Dr. Guma, I think it was a very uh, uh, good and I think a uh, very clear presentation. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, most of the things I think is well uh, explained. So, you know, I think uh, in Ethiopian setting, again, I think we, you know, the most of the hospitals may depend on uh, like non-invasive means to say, you know, oxygen and so on. So uh, I think things probably needs to be improvised uh, so that we can use, you may not get, you know, a negative pressure room, you know, but, you know, we can create things like, you know, uh, covering them, you know, with some kind of, you know, little plastic sheet and, you know, maybe when, if we use a high flow oxygen, maybe ask them to close their mouths if they can. Uh, and, you know, make sure, you know, that it's fit as, uh, you know, Dr. Mola said, uh, you know, I think those kinds of things should be created. And, you know, uh, I think uh, in general, you know, most of the patients are heavily managed just with oxygen supplementation. So uh, we should work our way around that. Uh, but it, it was a great presentation. Thank you. So great. So, so a few questions, Mola, before um, we, I think you have also touched them, uh, particularly the prone um, positioning. So um, there's a question about, you know, what, what is the physiologic basis? Why are these patients getting better? What is happening to the lungs and uh, the physiology of the lungs? Um, so that's one of the questions and you are muted. So so, yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, so prone positioning, if uh, you look at a classic ARDS patient uh, in the imaging, uh, it tends to affect kind of the back and the bottom of the lungs more than the uh, uh, anterior and the upper part of the lungs. And there are different theories, different, you know, thoughts about prone positioning. But the most important thing is you're trying too much uh, oxygen, uh, <clears throat> ventilation and perfusion. When you uh, put patients on a prone position, uh, then the most ventilated uh, part of the lung uh, uh, would be kind of down and it gets a, it gets a better uh, flow, you know, because flow is generally, blood flow is generally gravity dependent. So if the most ventilated area of the lungs is getting a larger uh, flow of oxygen, then um, uh, then you, you you're trying too much ventilation and perfusion. That's that's the most you know plausible theory how why prone positioning works. Other things is that when you prone uh, when you place patients on a prone position, you can recreate more alveoli that were in the dependent in the bottom of the lungs as well that can help. Uh, and there are other mechanical uh, reasons as well uh, that that prone positioning is working. But again, the well-known and the well-plausible reason is that you're matching ventilation and perfusion. You are getting good blood flow to the area where, where uh, there are many more ventilated alveoli. So to make things a little bit more practical um, for the Ethiopian context and, you know, both yourself as well as Dr. Zerihun, you, uh, you are all familiar, of course, with the situations. And, you know, we talk about the negative uh, pressure room, but, um, you know, we don't have those. And, uh, and also, um, so in general, from even the non-invasive procedures perspective, what are your practical recommendations for the group? Um, you know, if you were there, what would you do? So that's, I think, the kind of question they want to 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 answer, uh, because you know uh, all the ad additional items are not available. So, yeah. you, know, the, you know, some questions about tell us the practical thing. If you are here, what would you do? Uh, 
Can you elaborate a little bit on that? So yes, um, I the last time I have been in Ethiopia in the Black, at Black Lion Hospital is almost two years ago, and when I was there, I have not seen a, a, a lot of these devices that I spoke about. Uh, obviously, oxy masks and nano breathers are available, but high flow nasal cannula, the OptiFlow or the Vipotum that we use here is even not very widely available here in the United States. I mean, it's fairly. Uh, new, it, 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 it's becoming more available after that study that I showed you. So it's not, even in here, even in smaller hospitals, there are only like a few devices. Uh, I don't know how available are the BiPAP machines, but I anticipate that there are probably not, not many devices or not many places have them. So the, the, the devices that we have is the regular nasal cannula and then the oxy mask and then rebreather and then you know perhaps intubation and mechanical ventilation. So in a Ethiopian situation, we uh, in, in the hospitals that I saw and I have seen most patient most hospitals have big rooms where patients are sleeping, you know, next to each other. So what we can uh, I don't know if there are many uh, new centers that are prepared for this. Uh, COVID situation with with individual private rooms, but at least what we can do is practice this. What <laughs> the social distancing in our patients, you know, put them apart. Uh, at least uh, create a distance. If you have to have many patients in one room, try to create a distance between these patients. Number one, number two, your oxygen uh, use oxygen um, through face mask and nasal device, and be creative. Uh, you know, maybe erect uh, some metallic stand and uh, put a plastic uh, bag around the bed, something like that, try to be creative. Uh, we see here local people are creative in making masks and you know they're bringing us this box that I can put my hands in to intubate patients. So you know, these are all locally produced and I, I see in media that there are local uh, people are producing something like this locally as well. And then uh, the other thing is, I think the awake prone positioning is very practical and it's easy. It's just put them on oxygen and ask them to, uh, or help them to sleep in their, in their stomach as long as tolerated, typically two to three hours, gives them a break on their back, uh, one to two, uh, like for an hour or two. So the more you do it, probably the more, uh, the more beneficial. So these are the things I think we can, uh, we can recommend and, <clears throat> And uh, again, try to avoid intubation in an em emergent situation because things will get messy and it will be too risky for stuff. And have the best expertise available for intubation when the patients uh, do not do well on these kind of devices. So Mola, in terms of um, the patients who are intubated and in prone position, um, how often do you change their positions? in terms of uh, prone and supine? So prone positioning have been practiced for decades in the, in the United States, but small studies previously did not show benefit, mainly because number one, it was not done on time or early enough. Number two, it was not done long enough. So that land, landmark study that I showed you earlier, uh, that I spoke about, uh, they did in such a way that patients were prone early. Uh, it's not like a rescue when everything doesn't work in prone patients, but if you, if their oxygen requirements reach 60% and PEEP uh, positive index respiratory pressure requirements 10, that's the criteria they used. You know, they used if patients require more than 10 of PEEP and more than 60%. Let's not confuse you now, just you know, remember the 60% oxygen. If your patient on a mechanical ventilator requires more than 60% oxygen, then prone them as early as possible. And <clears throat> it was shown that you know, the longer the better. So in these patients average uh, minimum time on prone position was uh, 16 hours. Minimum time on prone position was 16 hours and it gives them a break on their back because we're not you know, used to sleeping on our face and stomach so it can lead into uh, skin necrosis and stuff like that. So you need to give them a break. So 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours on a, if tolerated very well, I, I think, and they say that it's the longer the better. So typically we prone patients for 16 to 18 hours, gives them a break on their back for four to six hours. 
uh, and you know continue to do this along with optimize, optimizing other form of therapy like the antibiotics, the diuresis, whatnot. Because patients intubated are not comfortable, uh, they may need deeper sedation. They may need uh, chemical paralysis as well. They may need to be on paralytic infusion, but I don't know if that's available in the Ethiopian context, but they may have a hard time tolerating prone position unless you keep them in a little deeper sedation and in certain situations, neuromuscular blockade. So if you want me to talk about this study, the prone patients, average proning time was again 17.6 hours. Uh, and the, how many times they proned, average number of proning was four times. And after that, patients tend to improve and stop. So you keep proning patients, giving them a break until their oxygen requirement gets better. That's what I can say. And I think this concept of self-proning early on probably is something that everybody can deal with. Um, yeah. And clearly, yeah. you don't want your patient to go into apnea in prone position, but, but very closely monitored and looks like a, a great suggestion. Um, one other um, question and thought here. Can is, I add something, uh, Dr. Gama? Yes, please. Uh, so I think, you know, one, uh, one suggestion I have is I think uh, not everybody responds to proning. So I think you should prone and keep prone only if you see a good response. So some people don't respond, you know, for a uh, different reason. So I think seeing the response is very key. So, and... Uh, you know, as Dr. Mola said, you know, we typically uh, keep them prone, you know, like sometimes 24 hour and, you know, even more if, if they respond very well, if, if they are better in that position. But, you know, this again, in the Ethiopian setting, it, 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 this, is, this is not a, a difficult process to prone someone, but to prone someone who is critically sick who, you know, whose oxygen reserve is nothing, he's, you know, hemodynamically unstable, it is very risky unless you train and prepare the, your nursing uh, respiratory, whoever team, very well trained and prepared, you know, a simple disconnection will expose people to the virus, you know, whenever you turn. And a simple disconnection may kill the patient as well, or a simple line, you know, and so on. So I think this needs to be, uh, you know, it's, it's a nursing driven, you know, there should be a big preparation in training, planning, avoiding pressures and, you know, all those things. So this is not something just flipping, you know, so I think I recommend that, you know, hospitals working, you know, uh, uh, on that. So, and, you know, the other thing, you know, I said is seeing the response is very key. Uh, um, you know, another thing I think, you know, you know, probably on the earlier question, I would like to uh, say uh, where there is no negative uh, pressure room. You know, again, you know, uh, we have seen a lot of creativity even in the U.S. and in the world. And I think simply copying those uh, would be, uh, would go a long way and, you know, coming up with uh, uh, things to be there. So simple plastic covering, you know, uh, in my mind, I was thinking about, you know, how, how can we create, you know, something like, you know, uh, uh, the helmet mask, you know, uh, those things, you know, I think those can be improvised in a, in a setting and, you know, probably trialed, you know, in, uh, um, you know, before uh, the spike of the cases. Uh, the other thing, you know, we did, you know, was, you know, getting the IV uh, poles outside the room so that the nurses can manage some of the the drips from, you know, not, they don't have to go in. You know, I, I mentioned the camera idea, you know, putting camera in the room so that you don't have to go in all the time. Uh, you know, another thing is, you know, uh, plastic covering, like, you know, when we intubate them, we cover them with plastic. We can apply the same thing when, uh, you know, with a BiPAP, you know, uh, or CPAP, you know, uh, 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 because the patients are getting most of the, the, the ventilation from, you know, the, the BiPAP or you know, completely from the BiPAP. So I think, you know, applying those, you know, the patient uh, is tolerance can help. Uh, the same thing for OptiFlow or, you know, high flow uh, nasal cannula. Uh, so we can measure, but, you know, uh, I think, you know, you guys probably have read, but, you know, the main mode of transmission for this virus is droplet. And, you know, 
uh, when we say airborne, I think, you know, we all are taking precaution and, you know, that's Um, you, so, got, I, you got muted. <laughs> we just lost you for a second. Hello? Yeah. Me? Go ahead. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, they got some viral particles, but, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, I think, as I said, you know, main precaution is, you know, uh, you know, avoiding the droplets and so on. So uh, those are the points I'd like to make. So two more questions. One is, uh, you know, with uh, the two phenotypes of ARDS, the L and H, um, does prone position, you know, apply more to one versus the other? I mean, it's really more an academic question here, but uh, is there any data to say one responds and the other doesn't respond, or what are you thinking? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't know. Again, uh, as Dr. Zerion said, uh, uh, clinically, <clears throat> not, all, not everyone, everyone uh, responds to prone positioning. So you have to continuously assess and see the response. That's the key. Um, uh, other than that, in, I, I don't know if there was any significant difference between the L and H types, but, uh, but uh, uh, but again, the, more, the key is clinically, the key is see the response. And some patients may not even tolerate, as Dr. Zerun said, when we prone patients, they become hemodynamically unstable, they become tachycardic, they desaturate. They, they, if they don't tolerate it, you have to flip them back. And one thing I need to add to that is um, you need to have a protocol. What Dr. Zerun said in detail is that always try to have when when uh, a protocol if you prone, decide to go ahead and prone patients to have a protocol that an airway expert is available nearby you know for example in my hospital the when nurses are ready to prone or uh, supine patients they call me and they make sure that i'm i'm uh, either in the unit or within like one or two minutes outside the unit so if there is an airway emergency when they flip patients, uh, then then uh, you need uh, there should be someone who can place the airway right right uh, right back back in. Uh, <clears throat> that's so, that's uh, yeah. So one additional uh, question and suggestion is you know if we have people on you know non-invasives and um, yeah you know, we talked about the. Uh, creating a containment zone with plastic coverings and all that stuff, but also how about just using some pleno uh, face masks and uh, see if we can, on applying them on the patient themselves. Is that practical? Is that something useful? What are you thinking? You're, mu you're muted, uh, Dr. Moldy. Sorry. I don't know if that would be practical because a patient with a face mask, there, there are like gadgets that's connected to, there's a wiring and tubing system, you know, that's connected to the device. And I don't know how we can, uh, you can be creative to try to make a kind of larger plastic bag around the whole neck. Uh, try to, you know, it will not be 100% protective, but it, it can potentially trap the majority of the uh, droplets. I don't know. Uh, but but given that, uh, again, the overall thing is that if this non-invasive ventilation is available in your system and if you have to use it, I mean, you try not to use it because there is a risk of aerosolization, but if other options are limited and if you need to use it, then try to be creative with something like that and, and uh, minimize the risk. And then if you ha in your hospital system, if you have few limited private rooms and the others are like shared rooms. Maybe these patients on BiPAP mask need, need, need to be in those private rooms uh, uh, so that there is not massive aerosolization and, and, uh, and risk to staff and other people. So there are, you know, it, it just needs, it, we just need to be locally creative and try to uh, use the best out of what we have. So maybe, um, you know, just to be sensitive about everybody's time and um, I think we'll uh, try to wrap up here and, and maybe Dr. Zerihun, um, with your presentation on Monday, if you can just include a picture or two of this kind of tent kind of situation around the patient's head 
you know, with, you know, be plastic or whatnot to, you know, just to have people an idea about what we are talking about. The visual may say a lot, so maybe that's a good idea uh, so that they can understand exactly what we are talking about. And one thing that's really, really important and in Ethiopian situation, something we um, are always worried and, and not um, getting that along well is, you know, uh, discussion between patients and families about the possibility of death. Uh, and I think at some point, maybe this is a topic that we may have to, you know, address um, how to communicate, how to bring those kind of questions with patients uh, and families and prepare them. Uh, because as Dr. Mola said earlier, a lot of times patients may have their wish ahead of time and they may say, I will take a a face mask, a high flow oxygen, a CPAP, but I'm not going to have, you know, an intubation and be on a mechanical ventilator. And those kind of wishes are usually spelled out early and they are, you know, respected, protected, and patients die uh, if they need to be intubated. So, so I think uh, discussing uh, issues around uh, death from, um, you know, uh, limiting um, treatment is something that uh, in Ethiopia we don't broach. And I think uh, partly uh, it is our love-hate relationship with death in general that we don't bring this issue, but probably we may have to think about um, a, you know, a presentation on that issue to cover. And then one other question that came up, which maybe in some of the talks in the next week uh, could be included is uh, the uh, tele-ICU. Um, which is, uh, I think, an important um, aspect of how our patients are cared for here in the U.S. And maybe, um, um, you know, Dr. Mola Zerihun, as we talk about this next week, we may want to sneak in a little bit about, you know, um, the limitations and uh, the advantages of uh, telemedicine. And the person who's asking this question, uh, is asking because you saw uh, our preliminary or early stages of uh, actually um, tele-ICU that we are trying to put together in, uh, in Hawassa. So that might be one additional thought, particularly Dr. Zeri, when you brought up the video issue and how people could be creative to stay out of trouble by staying outside. So, so you know, and, and the tele is really definitely way, way far, but it is something that probably needs to be brought up. And it might be something to consider how to engage you guys from the US and to work with, you know, with our intensivists in Ethiopia and, and be a buddy on the side uh, to talk um, about some patient care and maybe electronically around with them and so on and so forth. So I think there are some creative ways to do this and uh, maybe we can give it a little bit more uh, thoughts. Um, if, unless uh, Dr. Zerihun or Dr. Mola have a last minute something to say, I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll conclude here. Uh, Dr. Zerihun, any last thoughts? Uh, you know, I think uh, earlier there was a question on the type NLH and just to add a few things, you know, on what Dr. Mola said. Um, so, you know, the type L and the type H both could, you know, respond and or then not respond to prony. So, and, you know, so I think it's always good to attempt. Uh, uh, and, you know, in the type L case, you know, if it works, it's, it's by redistributing the blood flow uh, around, you know, the, you know, the alveoli. So, uh, you know, I think we, we use different positioning. For example, if, we, if I have a patient who has a right-sided pneumonia with a right lung, you know, really affected, you know, what I do is, you know, I'll keep them with their left lung down, you know, like on their left side, so that most of the blood goes, you know, to that side. So I'm trying to, you know, make, you know, a VQ mismatch, more better VQ mismatch. So it's the same principle. So, uh, you know, I think by the redistributing the blood, the blood as well as, you know, the alveoli uh, or the edema uh, in the lung, that's how it helps. So, it's always, you know, I think good to, uh, to attempt uh, this thing um, uh, on both cases. Um, I think that's the one I wanted to say. 
Dr. Mola, anything additional? Why not? Um, not much, but I wanna, uh, I probably wanted to add one thing that uh, in addition to what Dr. Verun was saying, you know, the, the overall, again, we talk about all these things, advanced treatment, you know, the most important care for these patients relies on <laughs> prevention of uh, spread in the Ethiopian context. So try to be careful, try to be creative locally, as I said, and, um, and uh, avoid spreading infection in a, in a healthcare setting. And Dr. Zaryun brought a very good idea of, you know, prolonging the IV tubing so that the IV line and the medications can be done from outside the patient room so that the nurse doesn't have to go 10 times. Um, even, uh, you know, I will tell you one thing, these negative pressure rooms are very loud rooms because, you know, these are all temporary rooms. They, they make a hole in the, patients, in, the, in the patient's rooms and connect them to an AC unit to make a negative pressure room here. So you cannot listen uh, it's hard to auscultate. So we tend to rely on, I have a pocket ultrasound. We, we do a cardiac ultrasound, lung ultrasound to see if there is pulmonary edema, to see if there is pleural effusion, make sure that they don't have pneumothoraces, uh, to see, the, to evaluate their hemodynamic status. And I don't use stethoscope, for example, because number one, it's hard to hear anything. Number two, it's just a risk of contamination, you know, to your ears, even if, you know, you take time to clean and stuff like that. So I just want to comment that you should not probably also, I'm sure every one of you know, use your stethoscope, put in your ears, put it in next patient, then go to the other patient. So be, just be mindful of that. If, if possible, you know, patients may have a very cheap disposable stethoscope for one, for one patient if possible, but I don't know if that's practical, but that can be a, you know, a medium of transmission of the virus for healthcare providers or even patient to patient. So, so just try to minimize contact with patients. And if he, something has to be done, just, you know, has, have one or two staff at the most taking care of that person and not 10 people, you know, going one after the other. That's, that's what, you know, what I wanted to say. So I appreciate uh, everybody, uh, the presenters, the audience on the other side. Um, want to remind you on Monday, our own Dr. Zerion is going to talk about core mechanical ventilation lecture on ARDS. Uh, it's going to be part one uh, to be followed by part two on Wednesday. Uh, we are going to do that at the same time. Um, so um, hope to see you then. Today's slides will be emailed to you all by Nalaku as usual. And, uh, and also follow up on his emails because uh, all these lectures are being uh, posted online so that um, uh, individuals who may want to listen to them again or um, uh, have their friends listen to them uh, is going to be uh, available for you. So thank you again for um, the partnership we are having and uh, talk to you guys on Monday. And uh, thank you, Mola, and thank you. for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you.